I want to talk to you about virtual reality and exploring invisible worlds. But before I do that, I want you to do something for me. In the true sense of experimentation and academic endeavor, I want you all to close your eyes. Imagine you're inside your own body. You're climbing up an artery. You're walking, climbing up your neck inside your body, inside an artery. You're dodging red blood cells and platelets. You're working way up, all the way up to inside your brain, to the tiny blood vessels that oxygenate your brain. And you just look behind you and there's a large clot just comes passing right over the top of your head and clogs the vessel right in front of you. Now you can open your eyes. Welcome back. What I'm going to talk about today <laughs> is how we are turning what you just experienced in your imagination into a reality, or literally a virtual reality. So I want to start off with a film, okay? And I want to start off with the year 1987. That was a big year for me. I got my first Sony Walkman, which was big. I also went to see this movie, Inner Space. It's a comedy, it's a piece of sci-fi, it's a bit of fun. But in that moment, a little seed was sown in my head, literally. How could I go inside my own body? How could I fly around like the character Tuck Pendleton, who goes inside a hapless cashier and explores these beautiful places that exist inside us? I wanted to be that pilot. So I'm going to talk to you today about a couple of projects that we're making this a reality. We're bringing together virtual reality headsets, data, artistic vision, and tech from the gaming industry to take people on a, on a fantastic adventure in an inner space. So I want to fast forward you from 1987 to 2014. And I had a chance encounter with the director of the rehabilitation unit at St. Vincent's Hospital here in Sydney. And he crossed the road at Oxford Street and he came across to my lab at Unit's WR Design. And we had a coffee and he said to me, John, we've got a problem with the communication. We want to communicate better, in a better way, to our stroke patients. In particular, ischemic stroke patients. Now I asked him, being a designer and an artist and a non-medic, what is a stroke? How does it work? And he said, well, it's when a blockage or an occlusion, in this case, blocks off a part of a small vessel in your brain and causes brain damage and impairment to this patient, which means they require rehab. But I said, well, why do you want to, why, why is communication and education significant? And he explained to me that, first of all, motivation is a big part of rehab with stroke patients. How do you get them to do the activities in his clinic? Second thing is anxiety. If they have high levels of anxiety, often they don't participate in the rehabilitation. And finally, prevention. He gave me a, a really interesting statistic that once you've had a stroke, you're six times more likely to have another one. And many of the reasons that you have another one can be lifestyle reasons. And so education and communication become critical. So each of the sonnets is design problem. And being a designer, I ask the question, do you take pictures of stroke? Do you show patients to communicate what a stroke is? And he says, yeah, we do take pictures. We take MRI scans. And I said, wow, cool. So magnetic resonance imaging scans take cross-sectional images through the brain, deep into the tissue, and it allows them to make a diagnosis. Um, and also write a report and decide on a course of action. So I said, well, do you show the patients these images? Yes, we do. They act as a prop at time times. We verbally explain and we sometimes show them these pictures. But there's a big problem with this. You need a significant amount of medical knowledge to navigate these images. They're not designed for um, your average Joe to actually access. They're designed for clinical radiologists or clinical professionals to draw a conclusion, in this case, in this clinical context. So, I was really interested in a way that we could take the data. So this is a clinical MRI of an actual stroke patient. These are the cross-sectional images playing one after the other, cutting through the brain. And these bright signal areas, these bright white areas, are the blood flow. And that's how they work out where the stroke may have occurred. But we were interested in saying, well, listen, we're designers. We come from visualization. We come from the gaming industry. How could we enhance these images? Now, 3D exists, we wanted to turn it into 3D to improve communication and try and enhance understanding. This is 3D, this is volume, volumetric three-dimensional visualization. You take the two-dimensional data, you know the end of the distance between each slice, and you build this 3D model. And that little circle, that red circle, is where the strokes occur. But we wanted to go a step further. 
And going back to that little seed of an idea I had when I was 11 and negative 87, I wanted to go inside, I wanted to walk along that artery. And I, we believe that actually that might make a difference to the way the patients understand what's going on. So we built a 3D model driven by the data. So this is the blood vessel being reconstructed in three dimensions. But the beauty of this is that you can put a virtual camera inside. Now you have it as a 3D wireframe. And so we put these virtual cameras inside. And we allowed the camera to go along with the point of stroke. For, for us, that was really good. We'd made, a, we, we, we'd made a development there. And we were thinking, well, we're going to play movies back to the patient. We'll sit them down in front of a screen, and we'll play back these walkthroughs to the point of the archery. But I want to take you on to VR. So some people say innovation is about being in the right place at the right time. And at that point, when we were getting to that point of visualization in 3D with this project, Oculus Rift came on the market. The DK1 became available for developers. And we went, yes! We're going to use this because this can give us an immersive experience. So we're no longer looking through a screen, a 2D window into a 3D world. We're going to give the illusion through a virtual reality headset that you put on and you look around that you're actually in a place, which provides a very different cognitive loading when you're trying to understand a concept. So this was our first prototype. So this is John, my researcher in the lab, my research fellow in the lab, and this was the first one that we built. So this is him looking down the artery. And you'll see he'll move his head in a second. And as he moves his head, the image updates. And those two images that you see that are almost identical are the two different images that the system projects into his eye. And it gives them an illusion of immersion. So as he moves his head, the position changes. But what's interesting as well, we, we, added, we had to add interface issues. Because data is just data. And even when you visualize it in 3D, it still needs some sort of visual language, some sort of interface design. So we develop lighting, we develop little maps, almost like a little torch, so it's a place that you wanted to stay in and not run away as soon as you put the headset on. And we took the patient to the point of their stroke. So I want to play another video. And this video is a patient walking along a walkway. The thing we found was that the human body and the human vascular system doesn't really lend itself well to walking along. So we had to provide walkways, we had to provide little ladders, we had to provide directions. Even with the medical professional trying to explain what they were looking at, where to go, we need to provide intuitive visual languages to help them. So you can see here in this video, they're walking along to the point of the stroke. And we added some temporal components, time-based components. So the buildup of arterial plaque, so the stuff that coats the inside of the arteries that causes narrowing. Not the clot itself, but the constriction and narrowing. And you'll see here the clot cascade happening. So the clot is actually building up and then it will break off. So we've added that to the data for narrative, but we're trying to communicate how, how the stroke happened with a virtual reality headset and an Xbox controller. And so the patient actually, while they're sitting down at the desk, had to actually crouch down and peer right forward to see the point where the narrowing happens, where the stroke occurs. So what are we doing with this? Well, we are actually running studies now to see whether this has an impact on understanding and that tackles some of these issues that I talked about earlier, about prevention, about anxiety, and, and other issues. And so we're sitting patients down at St. Vincent's and we're actually working with clinicians to actually allow them to walk along their arteries, not just some generic artery, but their arteries to see the point of stroke and understand more about why they're having rehab and what a stroke is. So I want to take you to another world. So I've taken you to the world inside, of, inside, of, inside your brain, these tiny blood vessels that become blocked. I'm working to a different scale now. We're going on the journey to the center of the cell. Okay, and this is a project that brings, brings together multiple universities in Australia. And we're looking at how we can image, reconstruct and create VR environments of cancer cells. So similar to the project we did with the stroke patients, we're actually looking at the data and allowing that to drive the 3D models and drive the visualization and then the VR. So this is an electron microscope. Very, very powerful piece of medical equipment, scientific, clinical, uh, scientific equipment. And what it generates is these 2D cross-sectional images, similar to the MRI. And this is a human cancer cell. But similar to that process, we wanted to reconstruct it into a wireframe. Build a 3D model. 
But you know, we were getting better at this. This is the second project we did. So we actually were, were able to delineate all the structures within that cell. Well, not quite all of them, but all the significant ones that relate to some of these new types of drug therapies that may treat cancer in the future. And so this video will build up the different parts of the cell. So you've got the nucleus, driven by the data in three dimensions. So it's building up in different parts. You've got the nucleus, the endosomes, the mitochondria, and then the cell membrane, completely in three dimensions. So we got really excited about this, but then we wanted to put it into VR. Now again, being in the right place at the right time, a new type of headset came on the market for developers to try. And this was the Vive. Now the Vive is a tremendous piece of equipment. We love it. It's room-size VR at the price of an iPhone. It tracks really well, it's got controllers. And you can walk around a space, so you're no longer at a desk with a controller, or an Xbox controller. You're actually standing up. Going back to that little childhood seed of an idea, I felt I was getting a bit closer. So you can actually move around and, and actually feel like you're truly immersed. So this is what we produced. Here we go, here we go. Oh. Try that again. There we go. So we are now standing on the surface of a cell, driven by the data. We now see a nanoparticle, a new type of drug delivery system landing on the surface of the cell. So the surface of the cell has been driven by the data, but we've had to add things. So we've added things like annotation, so you can label what you're looking at. The nanoparticle gets absorbed on the surface of the cell, and you're standing over it like you're looking over a giant hole in the ground. And some of the users have even described having a little bit of vertigo as they do so. But they're still in a room just for the headset on. And so you're looking across a vista, and we've used the language of landscape, so we've made it feel like it's somewhere you're grounded. We even call it the cell paddock, so it feels like a place. But we've also learned things from the gaming industry, so we've created doorways between levels. So we've got two levels of data, the surface, and now you're in the internal structures. You're standing on the nucleus and you're looking down over all the component parts that I showed you earlier that we delineated from the data. But you can teleport around, you can move around that surface. So that's the mitochondria and these are the endosomes. And if you really want to, you can actually put your head inside one. <laughs> but take your head out pretty quick because it's a bit weird. <laughs> The other cool thing is you can actually see it from a human scale. And this is a really interesting thing about VR. You're looking back at it like an architectural structure, which I think is really fascinating. And so you can see a lot of the detail that you would never see looking from the outside. And so you, we actually had to build walkways so users could walk around it, almost like an arterial structure. And we call this the cell cathedral, because it does feel like this massive void. So I've shown you two different worlds. One inside the arteries in your neck and in your brain, your blood vessels in your brain, and another one inside a cell, a cancer cell. However, I believe, and the team in my lab also agree with this, is that we're only scratching the surface of what we can visualize. MRI scanners, microscopes take more and more detailed information about all these different structures and tissues that exist in your body. But if we marry that with, it, with good VR experiences, places that we want to go, and artistic vision, we could go anywhere. I want to go to these places. And going back to this final slide, I would challenge you to come on this journey to these places and an adventure of incredible proportions.